Hi everyone, my name is Joe Kempton. Um, so I'm the lead 3D printing analyst at Canalis. Um, for those of you who don't know, Canalis is an independent analyst company. We do market research into various tech areas like PCs, tablets, smartphones, wearables, and now 3D printing as well. So this is going to be a bit of a 2015 year in review, a bit of a look at the state of the 3D printing industry. Uh, 2015 was a bit of a difficult year for the 3D printing industry, for those of you who know about it. Several of the major vendors saw their share prices fall to the lowest ever levels. We saw several vendors see their first ever year-on-year -year declines in revenues. The CEO of a major 3D printing company resigned. Some 3D printing vendors saw sales of shipments fall by more than 50%. And a major 3D printing events company went into liquidation as well, thankfully not TCT. But perhaps most worryingly of all, many of the major vendors who are involved in the industrial sector have been reporting a, uh, somewhat of a, of a, of a slowdown uh, in, in demand from, from the, the higher end of the, of the industry. That's particularly concerning uh, considering that that's really what's driving, driving the industry, uh, and that's what's um, pushing, pushing forwards a lot of the development in the industry as well. But it's not all been bad news. Other companies are reporting over 100% growth rates in revenue year on year. We've seen companies bring new products, new materials, new services, and the future tech is all very promising. So this is... Uh, uh, the canal estimates and forecasts for 2015. Um, 2015 has only obviously just ended, but these are the forecasts that we did in, in October 2015. Um, and we estimate that the size of the 3D printing industry is $4.5 billion. And that includes all revenues derived from the sales of 3D printers and their, their associated materials and services. Now, when, when we split that out geographically, we can see that uh, the largest share comes from the Americas. Uh, which makes up 45%. And when we talk about the Americas, obviously the largest portion in that is coming from North America, and from within that, the USA obviously makes up the largest country within that. Secondly, we have uh, EMEA at 34%. So uh, alongside the usual hotspots of the UK, Germany, um, some parts of, uh, of um, the Mediterranean as well, so it's Italy and, and Spain. We're also seeing some interesting hotspots in growth coming from Eastern Europe, particularly Poland. And finally, APAC is at the smallest share at 21%. Now, APAC has had a difficult uh, time in, in 2015. There have been real uh, currency headwinds going against many of the major vendors uh, based in the US and EU. Um, but also, we've seen government policies really favor local companies, uh, and as a result, many foreign companies have struggled to make an impact in APAC. But uh, going forwards, we expect APAC to return to growth and to reach similar sort of levels uh, as EMEA. So let's take a look at some of the top selling 3D printing companies of 2015. So, Canalis estimates that in 2013, just over 79,000 3D printers were shipped worldwide, and that grew to 132,800 in 2014, which is a really healthy growth rate of 68%. So, going through the list of some, some of the top vendors, XYZ Printing, Taiwanese-based 3D printing company, has really grown from strength to strength in 2015. They've come into the market um, with really competitively priced products, um, hitting price points where consumers and individuals will really uh, make impulsive purchasing decisions. Next, we have MakerBot, as you know, subsidiary of Stratasys. Um, they've had a difficult year in 2015, um, fall in sales due to a product issue with their smart extruder. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the news from CES this year, but they've come out with the smart extruder plus. Um, so these product issues have been resolved um, and provided it's, uh, it works the way they say it works, we expect to see MakerBot to return to uh, some level of, of normality in terms of shipments that it had been having in previous years. But what MakerBot has, which a lot of other companies don't have, is a real 
um, diverse ecosystem, real diverse 3D printing ecosystem. And this will really uh, carry them through into 2016 and beyond. Next, we have Ultimaker, Dutch 3D printing company. Again, really impressive growth over 2015. I think they recently announced in a press release they doubled their revenues year on year. Um, and if you notice these, these top sort of three vendors that I've just mentioned, they all sort of have followed a similar pattern of what we see in the smartphone industry, which is to have a normal product and then have a smaller and a larger version as well to try and capture as much of the market share as possible. And now we come to 3D Systems. 3D Systems has had quite an interesting year. Um, at, I think it was on the 29th of December last year, they announced that they were ceasing production of their Cube 3, which is their consumer branded 3D printer, um, which is quite a dramatic move, really. Um, they've always struggled slightly in, in the consumer space due to their no returns policy. Um, and now they've moved out of that category that it's going to create you know, a large vacuum for other companies to move in. And finally, Zortrax there. I've included Zortrax as an interesting case. They're a Polish-based 3D printing company. Um, I believe they said they saw their shipments triple year on year. Um, they've managed to sell to 180 different public institutions in Poland, and they're considering an IPO on the Polish Stock Exchange as well. So I think the withdrawal of 3D systems from the consumer space is really reflective uh, of what has been obvious for so long uh, in the industry, but which has been massively overhyped by much of the media. And that is that 3D printing in the home was never going to take off in the way that people said it was. 3D printers in homes may still become commonplace, and indeed they will in developed countries like the USA and the UK. But it's not going to be a case of every home having a 3D printer, at least not yet. So instead, what we see is education being the real category of growth going forwards. And the, while the consumer sector will still be an area of large growth, it still requires several things to be achieved first before it can really explode much in the way that the hype has been generated around it. So at Canalis, we believe there is a large amount of convergence with 3D printing and other technology which is occurring and will occur in the near future. Prototyping with virtual reality and augmented reality, VR and AR. Currently, uh, prototyping has been massively improved thanks to 3D printing. You know, the ability to rapidly and cheaply create uh, a prototype using 3D printing has meant that it is the largest category uh, for, for 3D printing. But we believe that VR and AR will both complement and compete with 3D printing for prototyping. You can easily imagine how visualization in real time and changes being made in real time will be made much easier with the use of VR and AR, particularly if you have many more voices being added to the mix and new prototypes have to be made each time changes are are added. It begins to lose a lot of the cost and time benefits uh, once, once you have that many more voices being added into the mix. And secondly, new devices are emerging all the time with integrated 3D scan scanners and cameras. You've got tablets, PCs, smartphones, maybe in the future even wearables as well. So up there on the screen in the middle, I've got the Den Dell Venue 8, which has an integrated 3D camera, and the HP Sprout as well. For 3D printing to really take off in the consumer space, what's needed is to improve the ease and simplicity for consumers to create their own 3D scans and files. And the only way they're going to be able to do this is if they have the technology at their fingertips to be able to quickly and rapidly produce these. Now, this isn't going to lead, as I said before, to people just 3D printing everything in the home. More likely, it's going to be uh, through service bureaus, which will grow uh, massively throughout the next coming years. And finally, um, the Internet of Things will both facilitate and be facilitated by 3D printing. So we believe that you know, with all of these devices coming out with integrated uh, apps with 3D scanners, there's going to be a huge amount 
of, of uh, enablement for optimization of 3D printing. Changing colors, changing speeds, changing quality, changing materials on the fly will be much easier with the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things will also facilitate or be facilitated by the Internet of Things. So uh, you've heard from people like Voxel8 about printing with, with electronics as well. And just think about the doors that that opens to the future of creating everyday products integrated into your home through the Internet of Things. And this leads me on to my next point, which is that there are more and more opportunities emerging uh, in the 3D printing sector. You know, materials has always been a large area, but services is really going to be the area of growth. For most companies, Creating, uh, entering the 3D printing space is a, is a lucrative and an attractive option, but they don't want to invest the huge amounts of time and money into the hardware. More likely, software uh, and related services are going to expand massively. Security, cloud and storage, software, apps, connected wearables, all of these will be areas of growth. So as I said, most companies will not be entering the market with a 3D printer. But for some, they will be. And there, are th there were three main key announcements from Q4 2015, where we saw Toshiba, Ricoh, and Canon all announce their entry into the 3D printing space following the likes of HP. Now, uh, to go through these different companies, there's an interesting coincidence, which is that they are all Japanese multinational electronics companies with a red logo. Um, if we start with Toshiba, they uh, have claimed they're coming to market with a metal-based 3D, uh, 3D printer, which can print 10 times faster than current market speeds. Next, we've got Ricoh. Um, they've previously been a distributor of LeapFrog um, 3D printers, so focusing, again, on the education sector. And now they are planning on creating an industrial SLS printer. And finally, Canon, which I think is probably the most interesting of the three. They've uh, said they are coming to market with a brand new technology, a resin-based lamination technology. Now, all of these companies uh, have said they are entering the market in the coming years. It's likely to be end of 2017, probably 2018. But there's three key things we need to remember about these companies coming into the market. They can benefit massively from their established brands. I think if you ask the average person on the street who doesn't know much about 3D printing to name a 3D printing brand, they might know MakerBot, probably not much else. So these companies have a real uh, ability to, to come into the market with their brand um, and pick up a lot of customers from it. They can also leverage their built-in infrastructure, which they have from their regular IT uh, sectors. So things like 24-hour customer care lines, you know, established returns policies. These are all things which a lot of newer companies entering the market neglect at first or don't have the time or, or, or the employees to handle. And also drawing in channel partners. You know, these are companies who have many established channel partners around the world. And when they come to bring a market, they can bring it like that to hundreds of countries. However, there's a key point, which is that when you buy a 3D printer, especially as an uh, industrial company, you're entering a long-term commitment. Buying a 3D printer is not just a one-time expense. Most 3D printing companies, especially in the industrial sectors, um, will have a warranty which is voided if you use third-party materials. So you're tied in to the ecosystem. You're tied in to buying those materials time and time again, probably for years or maybe even decades. So these companies, and companies which will soon enter as well, need to demonstrate a long-term commitment to the 3D printing industry. They need to make sure that the clients are aware that they're not just in it for a quick buck, and when the profits dry up, they're just going to leave straight away in five years. And finally, new entrants are really going to struggle to gain significant market share in this industry unless they have a real unique selling point. 
And I've talked before about how 2015 has been a difficult year. We believe you know, the, the market is returning to some level of normality. But what if it doesn't for another few years? And when these companies enter, the market is still in a transitional phase. What if uh, industrial clients are still withholding the amount of investment that they put into 3D printing? But I think what's really important to remember is that all of these new entrants bring validation to the market. You know, These are companies which spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars making calculated risks. And when they enter a market, they're doing it because they know that there is a guaranteed profit for them there. And I think this, this next slide really illustrates how the market has evolved massively. And it's a vast and diverse opportunity area for many, many different companies. It doesn't matter whether you're entering with, you know, creating your own 3D printer, maybe the, the company is investing in 3D printing projects, maybe you're filing patents like uh, Apple and Samsung are doing, but nobody really knows what they're doing. Or maybe you're reselling 3D printers and materials. Previously, this industry was treated uh, as, an, as an established IT industry, particularly by investors, and that was not the case at all. It was a manufacturing industry, but it is evolving slowly into an IT industry. And the average person on the street is going to take a look at that slide and know every name. So it's becoming to, be, to look more like a traditional IT industry, and it's, becoming, it's starting to behave more like a traditional IT industry. Now, these are the Canalis forecasts for shipment sales. So in, in 2014, as I said before, um, we estimate that 132,800 uh, units were shipped worldwide, and that that grew in 2015 to just over 216,000. We still believe that the outlook is extremely positive for the 3D printing industry, in terms of shipments, at least. By 2019, it will grow to 2.5 million units, which is a very healthy growth rate of almost 80%. Again, education is going to make up a large portion of this growth, as is consumer as well. But it's, it's a clear sign that the market is still performing exceptionally well. So to give you four conclusion points, the 3D printing market is you know, moving through a difficult transitional period. We expect to see more turmoil. There's probably going to be a level of consolidation. Smaller vendors, particularly at the lower end of the industry, um, will be forced to move out as profits dry up for them. And there may be some mergers and acquisitions as well. And as the confluence of 3D printing with other technology areas begins to accelerate, we're going to see new opportunities arise for a whole range of different vendors. These new vendors will enter the market and they will benefit from established brands, but they may struggle in the transitioning market. And they will struggle unless they have a unique selling point and a really, really uh, important unique selling point. And the future is still bright for 3D printing. And we expect you know, the industry to return to some level of normality in 2016. It's going to be a difficult time for the industry, but we believe the future is more exciting than ever. Thank you very much.